So welcome everyone to the fifth day of the bootstrap. So today we'll have the first lecture by Slava Richkov. He will tell us about QFT axioms and Lorentzian CFT. Okay, well, um, so the, the rationale for these lectures is that since uh, uh, conformal bootstrap is, a, is an axiomatic approach uh, to doing conformal field theories, it's interesting to, to see how it relates to various other axiomatic approaches that people have developed over the years. And we already had uh, seen some of it in the lectures by Edward Witten earlier this week. So that was an algebraic approach to quantum field theory based on the algebras. But in fact, um, there was an even earlier approach axiomatic approach to QFT, which was based on Whiteman and Osterwalder Schroeder axioms. And um, I am going to review these axioms, which uh, are in a sense closer to the bootstrap because they deal with correlation functions. It's what uh, we are also dealing with in CFTs. And in the second part of, uh, of my lectures, I'm going to show that uh, some aspects of Lorentz and CFT uh, can be uh, derived consistently with what is expected from these axioms from the usual rules of Euclidean conformal field theory that, that we are familiar with. So in a sense, uh, we can, um, when we do Lorentz in physics, there's a way to do Lorentz in physics, uh, which does not represent extra assumptions. So you might think that, okay, if you do Euclidean CFT and then you continue to do Lorentzian and then you're using some properties of Lorentzian correlation functions, does it represent extra assumptions or not? And at least for some aspects, we will see that it does not represent extra assumptions. So it's, it's good to know this. So the plan of the lectures is, uh, is the following. So the first couple of lectures, I'm going to talk about this historical uh, introduction review of what people knew very well in the 60s and the 70s and then we, we have forgotten but it's good to know this i'm going to talk about whiteman axioms i'm going to talk about uh, the role of the theory of distributions temporal distributions that uh, appear and feature prominently in this um, lorentzian qft physics and then I'm going to uh, remind also about uh, osterwalder schroeder axioms, which are the axioms for Euclidean correlation functions. Uh, and uh, there are some subtleties that I am going to explain, uh, which appear if you want to go from uh, this Euclidean axioms, osterwalder schroeder axioms, to back to the Lorentzian. So there are some classic theorems. Uh, which are often cited for that, which are called OS reconstruction theorem. But as I will explain, uh, these theorems, uh, they, they have some fine print conditions, which are called linear growth condition. And so you cannot, for example, if you are just a, a CFT person, you cannot just appeal to those theorems in order to claim that you actually have Whiteman physics under control. So that's it's not automatic because this linear growth condition, as I will explain, it doesn't obviously hold in uh, our conformal field theories. And so then, uh, so this first couple lecture is going to be a review. And then in the third lecture, I'm going to show uh, that there's an alternative path to Whiteman physics, to Lorentzian physics, which just starts with CFT axioms. So with conformal block decomposition for the Euclidean Four point function. And uh, so the, the, there is a way to analytically continue this um, to the Lorentzian, which is uh, very different from what people used in the old days of Stravada and Schrader, but it just goes through the Roro bar expansion or Zs bar expansion. And uh, so there are many examples you know, people have over. Uh, over the years, they use this uh, Roro bar expansion may, in many ways to uh, to obtain the Lorentz and CFT four point functions in various regimes. 
And uh, what I will show is that actually it's possible uh, to use this approach to construct the Lorentzian whitening functions everywhere where you might possibly need it. So not just in all the regimes that people have previously constructed, but just everywhere. And to show that what you get is really a function which satisfies Whiteman axioms. So, so this approach is actually universally applicable, as I will explain. So it's a very explicit and very economical way to uh, to reconstruct uh, Lorentzian physics from CFT, Euclidean CFT, and I think it deserves to be uh, known. And so this is this last lecture is going to be based on uh, on a couple of papers that I wrote with uh, Peter Kravchuk and Jashin Chow. So that's the plan. And okay, I uh, I realized that we're all very tired. Uh, we had too many Zoom talks and so on, too many Zoom lectures. So this is supposed to be extremely uh, elementary and um, pedestrian. So please, uh, let's just not be stressed up and let's take uh, let's take a very relaxed approach. There's no rush. So just uh, yeah, wherever you feel like interrupt. So this story starts with something which is called uh, Gordian Whiteman axioms, and there are uh, very good books about it, classic books published in the 60s and 70s that you might want to take a look at if you don't know these books by Streeter and Whiteman by Yost. So these axioms, they say that uh, if you take uh, a quantum field theory in in Minkowski space in the dimensions, then uh, it really defines this quantum field theory as something which is based on a Hilbert space. On this Hilbert space, there is a, a unitary representation of Poincare group. And there are various constraints that you have to impose that are physically very reasonable. For example, the energy momentum spectrum uh, has to belong to, to the closed forward light cone, which is denoted V plus bar. So this is this is the spectrum of your of your theory. Uh, so usually you assume that there is just a unique uh, Poincare invariant state omega, which is the vacuum. So the theory has a unique vacuum. And uh, you assume that there are- a mass gap? Sorry, Slava, do we assume a mass gap here? You may or may not assume uh, mass gap. So in fact, you can do many things without assuming mass gap. So we shouldn't assume mass gap if you want to do CFT. But this uniqueness of the vacuum is a bit tricky if you have massless particles. Uh, well, um, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's. Uh, uh, I'm not sure it's tricky, but. Uh, well, I mean, if 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 it's if there is a mass gap, then I think you can define this vacuum as a it's going to be an eigenstate. So it's um, it's a unique state which is really annihilated by this PMU operator. So it's it's an eigenvalue. It's an eigenstate of of PMU. If uh, so, if the spectrum is continuous it's still an eigenstate. And I think you assume that it's the only eigenstate which has, uh, which, uh, so you, you can associate a projector with any closed subspace of, um, of the closed forward light cone. So let's consider the projector which projects the Hilbert space to the uh, to, to the tip of the cone, and so the claim is that the the image of this projector has only has dimension one. So I, I think this uh, a rigorous uh, statement makes sense rigorously. Okay, I, I mean I don't know, uh, but there is the, all these large gauge transformations. On the... I'm sorry. There's like all these large gauge transformations that don't change with soft photons that don't change the energy but but anyway it's it's probably not important for this discussion 
No, it is potentially important, but uh, what I want to say, what, what may what what may be happening is that, for example, in some strange way, these Gordon Whiteman axioms are not sufficient to describe gauge theories because of the effects that you're describing. This this we can discuss later. But what I'm just saying is that it it math, makes mathematical sense to say that vacuum is a unique Poincaré invariant state even in the theory in which there is no mass gap. I see. So the, there might be some transformations which map the vacuum to something else, but those transformations are not Poincaré transformations. So I'm just saying that Poincaré transformation maps vacuum to itself, mm -hmm. and there is no other state which has this property. So that's, I think, is a... Slava, yeah. And what if you just take a massless field, and you act with a dagger at zero momentum and zero energy? That's also Poincaré invariant and has p plus equals zero. Mm. But that's if you if you act with a dagger, you know, you don't get an invariant, you don't get a normalized state. So when we talk about states in the Hilbert space, we really mean about about vectors which have finite norm. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks guys for asking. It's really what I was intending here. So, uh, and uh, I should also say that uh, Jashin is in the audience. So Jashin, if you if you notice that I say something wrong, then please speak up because uh, uh, this, these are subtle issues. Uh, so, uh, so and then there are these field operators O of X that I'm going to talk about, in, uh, which transform covariantly under Poincaré. But in fact, the second axiom says that these fields are not themselves operators, but they are what is called operator value distributions. So, which means that to get true operators, you have to uh, to smear these fields with some test functions f of X. And uh, to get a, a good theory, actually, these test functions, they, uh, they, you have to allow for test functions of Schwartz class. So not necessarily compactly supported test functions, but uh, some test functions that can uh, vanish, slow, vanish sufficiently fast at infinity. So this integral sign, actually, in this equation, it's a symbolic integral sign. So it's not a true integral. I'm just saying that the only thing which is properly defined is this combination of O and F. So in this uh, lectures, there are going to be most of the integral signs are actually going to be these symbolic integral signs. But some of the integral signs are going to be true integrals. I'm going to say which ones are which. So we have this operators O of F, but uh, as we've seen in Edwards lectures uh, also earlier this week, uh, these smeared field operators are actually unbounded operators. So they don't act on the full Hilbert space. Uh, but there is a dense subspace of uh, states on which these operators do act. Namely, if you take a vacuum and you're, allow and you're allowed to act on the, on the vacuum with an arbitrary number of uh, smeared field operators and you still get a normalized state. So that's at least guaranteed. That's that's an assumption. So um, and you also assume that subspace generated by such states, uh, which are obtained by acting on the vacuum several times with smeared field operators, is dense. Finally, uh, the last constraint is the microcausality constraint. It says that if you take Two smeared operators which are associated with test functions which have space like separated supports. So, not necessarily compactly supported, but at least uh, uh, space like separated, then two such uh, smeared operators commute. So, I'm just considering scalar field case for simplicity. If we were dealing with Fermions, then they would anti commute, but okay, let's just discuss scalars for simplicity. Okay, so these were the first axioms called the Gordon Whiteman axioms, and uh, they deal with the Hilbert space. 
But then uh, once you have these axioms, uh, the, the, the natural thing to do is to consider uh, these so-called Whiteman functions, which are just correlation functions of field operators, a bunch of field operators in the vacuum. So we know that if we act several times with field operators, smeared field operators on the vacuum, we get a normalized state. So you can take an overlap again with the vacuum and this gives you certain distribution. So it's called Whiteman function, but in fact, it's a tempered distribution because it's only defined when smeared in this variables x1, xn. Uh, so, so in general, this is really a tempered distribution, so it can have all sorts of singularities on light cones, but not only on the light cones. It can have singularities potentially in some open regions of uh, Lorentzian configurations. So for some, for some special uh, configurations of X, uh, these Whiteman functions might actually be ordinary functions. For example, we will see later that if all x is a space like separated, then these are actually ordinary functions. But in general, it's in the general QFT, it's very hard to say, might be some very singular distribution. And that's the only way to, to think about it. Slava, can I ask? So this is this is uh, not known, or is it expected that as you cross light cones, you might actually not get a function after you cross the light cone? Well, I'm, I'm not sure of any explicit that, examples. Yeah. I'm not sure of any explicit examples, but for example, in in lecture three, I, when I will describe the situation in CFT. Mm -hmm. I will show that there are actually some big regions of configurations where at present we don't know if a CFT four point function is a true function or a distribution. So like if, like if you use all CFT properties that, that you can lay your hands on, you can prove that it's a distribution, but there is nothing in those properties that tells you that it's an actual function. So either we don't know or more work is needed uh, to show that it's actually a function. So it's kind of open to, to discussion. Okay, thank uh, you. And if you take a QFT, then I, I think it's even more, uh, it's even harder to say. So I, I don't know. I really don't know. I, think, I don't think anybody knows. But it gives you a framework to at least ask the question. So as, as we will see later, so if you, if you have a distribution, uh, then uh, the next natural question is to ask what is the regularity of the distribution? So distribution is characterized by its regularity parameter and you can try to work and determine what is the best regularity that you can have. And you know, if you manage eventually to show that it's a function, then it's going to correspond to certain good regularity, but you might not be able to do this. So uh, so then you, what you next do is that you use this gordon whiteman axioms to show some properties of this Whiteman functions. And these properties are, most of them are very easy. So for example, you can very easily show that this Whiteman functions are Poincaré invariant. Uh, you can uh, easily show that they satisfy hermeticity property. So if you take the complex conjugate of a Whiteman function, then this just corresponds to inverting the order of the arguments. Uh, then the third property is, is the clustering property. So it says that if you take uh, a Whiteman function, which is associated with uh, two groups of operators, and if you separate these two groups in some space-like direction, then the Whiteman function goes to a product of two Whiteman functions in the sense of distributions. So, uh, so this is actually, uh, th this property is a bit trickier to prove. So it doesn't have really like a very slick, uh, a very slick, a rigorous, simple, rigorous proof. But nevertheless, it, it can be proven. So you can read the proof on the street of the Whiteman book. And interestingly, you can prove that if the theory has a mass gap, then this approach 
to when, when you separate these two groups of points in a space like direction, then it, it goes to the product of two Whiteman functions exponentially fast, as you might expect. So this is something that you can actually show. And uh, if the theory doesn't have a mass gap, then you can still show that in any D in any space time dimension, uh, it will go uh, to the product at least as a, so the error is going to be suppressed by a power of the distance. So that's uh, something that you can show without, um, without assuming the mass gap. This is the clustering property. Okay, uh, to, so to formulate the, the next property, we, uh, we use the fact that because of translation invariance, we can write the Whiteman function, which is a function of n variables, w of x1, x1. We can write it as a, as a function Sorry, of- Sorry, Slava. I have a very naive question regarding the distinction between function and distribution. Here, for example, a CFT would have some power law singularities as you approach the light cone those are the ones that cause it to become a distribution and not a function so uh, so the um, indeed uh, th there are there are going to be a wide mode function in the cft in particular it will have various singularities so there are going to be some singularities on the light cone and those will already force you to think of it as a distribution but those are kind of simple singularities. You might say, okay, well, it's just some power law singularity in the light cone. Yeah, if I really want to think it as a distribution, I will, but you know, I can think of it simple power law singularity in many different ways. Mm -hmm. And maybe you'll get away with it. But mm -hmm. then you say, okay, but there are also singularities on double light cones. Mm -hmm. And then there are even you know, some regions which appear when you cross several light cones and you go to some like totally time-like separated regions. I see. So, which so are actually not function. even points. Uh -huh. These are regions which have positive volume in, in your space of coordinates. <clears throat> and, and it just turns out that in these regions of positive volume, you basically don't know what's happening. I mean, your function can be very wild there. It doesn't have to be a function there. It can behave in some very weird wild way, which only makes sense after being smeared. Okay, so Such this happens for happen. higher point functions, like three or Even four, four or... Yeah, so this can happen starting from four point functions in CFTs. Okay, thanks. So, uh, Okay, so let, let me cons continue with this uh, uh, review. So the, you express the Whiteman function of endpoints as a, as a function of coordinate differences. And then you do a Fourier transform in every coordinate dis difference. So you define this Fourier transform W hat. And then there is a spectral condition which says that this Fourier transform is going to be zero unless uh, all momenta q1 qn q1 qn minus one they belong to the forward to the closed forward null cone so this is the spectral condition and in physics this spectral condition is usually proven by inserting um, the uh, resolution of unity uh, in um, in terms of uh, states forming uh, kind of you take the full basis of states of your theory, you pretend that it gives you a resolution of unity. And okay, this is not fully rigorous because those states are not normalizable states, but you can actually make this argument rigorous. So you can show that this spectrum, indeed the, the, the Fourier transform, which is a distribution by the way, because so the, the Whiteman function was a distribution as I will explain, its Fourier transform is also distribution and that distribution vanishes uh, if you contract it with some test function, uh, which has support outside of the forward null cone in all variables. That's the content of the statement. Uh, is it obvious that uh, you picked an order of the points? This condition of forward light cone is independent of the permutation of the labels? Uh, well, it, it isn't dependent because I say that all Qs 
have to belong to the forward null cone. If all Qs belong to the forward null cone, then if you permute, they are still all belong to the forward null cone. I thought the Qs are only the single order in K to K plus one. They're, they're not independent if, they're, if you take all pairs. There's uh, not that many independent variables. No, I'm sorry. Uh, you you must you you must be thinking about something which is not written here. So, I said uh, take W, uh, which yes. depends on x one x n. So Xs Xs of course are differences of two consecutive Xs. That's that's right. important. So that's important. Yes. So yes. That, that, that's very important. Yes. So if I were if I were to choose Xs which are not uh, uh, consecutive Xs, then the argument already at the physics level would break down because you wouldn't be able to insert resolution of unity. You only insert resolution unity between two consecutive operators. Right. Now, if I permute the labels and take another representation of Qs, it's still true. Yes, must be. Well, it's important that you have to take the Fourier transform of the position differences of consecutive operators. And then, uh, such for a transform will have will vanish unless all of these momenta belong to the forward light cone. You can take the Fourier transform with respect to moment differences of different operators, not consecutive, but then those will not necessarily belong uh, to the forward light cone. Okay. So that Fourier transform will still exist, of course, but it's not going to have this property. So that's the spectral condition. Okay, so that's this is the last axiom, the positivity axiom. So it's uh, mm, so it's a bit formal. So let me uh, let's let's carefully go look look at this. Uh, so you you take uh, you do something funny. So you take a vector space. You form a vector space of sequences of functions. So you take this uh, sequence f0, f1, f2, f3. So f0 is just a complex number. f1 is a is a function uh, of one variable. f2 is a function of two variables, and so on. So now, if you take the two sequences f and g, which belong to this vector space. So th these sequences, they're supposed to terminate. So eventually, starting from a certain number, all these functions are zero. Then uh, given two such sequences, you can form, you define their inner product, uh, which is defined by taking products of Gs with F daggers and integrating them against Whiteman functions of n plus m variables. So you take x's and y's, and you notice that you take y's in the opposite order, and you integrate in x and y. And now you take a sum in n and m. So it's a finite sum because this, fun this sequence is terminate eventually. And the claim is that this inner product that you, for some reason, decided to introduce is going to be positive definite. And uh, okay, well, this looks a bit formal, but in fact, uh, it's it's not uh, difficult to see why it has to be positive definite. Well, because uh, what is let's look at what is f the inner product of f with itself. Well, it's actually uh, you can consider a state which is given by the following equation. So you take the vacuum and you act on the vacuum by f zero plus a smeared operator, single smeared operator OF1, then uh, a doubly smeared operator OX1, OX2, and so on. And then you take, so by, by the Gordon Whiteman axioms, this state uh, is a finite norm state of the Hilbert space. So you can compute its norm. And then you see immediately that the norm of the state is actually going to be given by this expression that I took a little bit out of the hat. And so it has to be positive definite. Uh, Slava? Yeah. So here, this W has a reference to the specific operator O. 
So is this norm defined with respect to this operator O or like, yeah, I, I, I'm just confused uh, about if we are, you know, if we are given some, you know, QFT, then uh, whether this inner product is something unambiguously defined. Um, yeah, so if, uh, so here I'm assuming that uh, for simplicity that I'm, I'm building the whole framework for just a single operator O. I see. So uh, of course we know that uh, in any theory of interest there are going to be several operators, uh -huh. infinitely many operators as a matter of fact. And so what you're then supposed to do is to just repeat this construction for all operators that you that exist in your theory, they're going to be some, let's assume there is countably many operators. So all of these operators, and of course, you're allowed to use several operators um, simultaneously. So for example, if your theory has uh, two operators, then you're allowed to, to take things like uh, O1 here and O2 here. I and so see. Then, and so then what you are going to be then uh, defining, you are going to be considering a high, a, a larger, uh, a much larger uh, vector space of sequences where each uh, function f is only, is also going to be endowed by a bunch of indices here, like i, j, uh, so which will tell you that you're supposed to take an operator i number i and an operator number j. So there's see. going to be a much larger uh, vector space of, oh, but still of finite sequences of test functions. And then on this much larger vector space, you will still have a, uh, a positive definite inner product. But uh, this is really uh, kind of a minor technical point, which just adds a bunch of indices over there, uh, all over the place, but it doesn't really change uh, much any mathematics. So uh, I, I prefer not to, uh, to lighten the notation. I'll just pretend that they have one uh, operator. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Slava, can I ask also a question? Since you are in Minkowski, Lorentzian limit, so your white band function, maybe it's just terminology, depending on different time order, they are really different. So therefore, when you take the Fourier transform, each one is a different distribution function. Isn't that correct? Uh, no, it doesn't, it's not quite correct. So I, um, well, first of all, I mean, if, if I just have a single, in, in this simplified uh, discussion, I'm just assuming that I have a single operator O. Yes. Then uh, you there, there there's no such thing as time ordering because uh, uh, I'm just uh, I'm just saying I'm just taking this function w of x one x n so I just said okay you have n operators insert one operator at x one one at x two one at x n so if you yes, ins if you insert the operators in the opposite order well it just will correspond to permuting the no. uh, variables of this function. So you, you might want to consider such function, but what's the point? It's the same function, just- I, I understand, of course, yeah. it's the same. The, of course, you also anticipate for a given time ordering, it's, it has, there's certain analyticity in the coordinate, but then the function vanishes when you have different, uh, that particular function, cannot be continued into a different time ordering. So in that sense, in X space, it's already a distribution. As a I, think what you're, I think what you are trying to say is this, which, which is indeed a valid point, is that, okay, if I consider this function, so there is a single function, W, X1, Xn. Yes. But what you are saying is that, I mean, the actual, the issue here is not a time ordering, but rather a causal ordering. Yes, I, I actually so, said that. So we might want to consider this function x1, xn for different causal orderings between these points x1, xn. For example, we yes. might consider a situation where x1 is in the past of x2, 
and so on in the past of XN. That would be one causal ordering. Yes. Or we might want to consider a situation where all these points X1, XN are uh, space-like separated to each other. Or we might want to consider some other situation where, for example, X3 is going to be in the past of X2, which is going to be in the past of X1, or and so on. Uh, there, are, there are all these different causal orderings. And uh, you might want to think of each of these different causal orderings as a separate function that's and correct. try to relate these various functions. But that's not a good way to think about it. You just have to think about, because, because between to pass from one causal ordering to another causal ordering, you have to cross some light cones. Yeah, and, those are and, and we are very problem. interested about what's going to happen when we cross those light cones. So we are not going to treat every causal ordering, at least not in this lecture, as a separate function. We are just going to treat it as one single function with the understanding that it includes all of these causal orderings. And so that, that was my question. So the question is crossing. How do you go from one causal ordering to the other in Q space? I mean, maybe you're going I to talk you about- you were asking about the future. Fourier transform, but okay. Yeah, yes. in, when, when you go to Q space, the, the, you have a particular causal ordering by saying all the QKs in your particular ordering are in the forward light curve. Uh, now you can try to change the values of Q, but I, I agree, you got to go across the no, line. I, I'm afraid, uh, Richard, I'm afraid you're just confusing everyone. So uh, really? okay. let, let's just <laughs> agree that there is a single function X1, Xn, which contains all information that you might possibly be interested in. For example, if I'm interested in this cause learning situation, then I just look at this function and I contract yeah. it with a test function, which, which orders points in this way. But if I'm interested in a different causal situation, then I change my test function, which I, I choose my test function phi x1, uh, uh, not phi I, f. I, I, I don't think I'm confused, but I, I think we're just No, it's it. not like you're confused. You are not confused, but you're confusing everyone else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. And so, so, and so let's, we let's will have just there. one single function, which contains a different all, all information. And we are not going to try to think of all these different causal learnings as different functions. That's not a good way. No, to no, do. I agree with that. I, that's what I'm trying to ask exactly okay. that. So, um, so I agree. You can define a course for each causal order. But the, the statement is that can you get from one to the other uh, by um, continuing? No, you cannot get from one to the other, no. No. That, that's really my point. Yes. No, you yeah, but, get well, from okay. One to the let's other. let's go on. Let's let me not interrupt. Go ahead. Come on. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I will. As I will see that uh, what what we could do, but not to get from one to the other. It's not possible. Not in general. But okay. What was the point of all these different axioms that I uh, introduced? Is that uh, so? I introduced two sets of axioms: this Gordon Whiteman axioms. Uh, GW1, GW4, and these uh, properties W1, W5, uh, which are uh, formulated in terms of very different set of data. So they, they, there is in W1, W5, there is no Hilbert space anymore. There is just some bunch of distributions. And so this W1, W5 are called Whiteman axioms. So they are formulated for these distributions. And there is an interesting theorem, which is called Whiteman reconstruction theorem, uh, which says that actually these two points of view, in terms of Hilbert space and in terms of distributions, they are completely equivalent. So, uh, so the theorem says that if, so as I explained, if you are given a Hilbert space, then you can construct the distributions. But the theorem goes in the opposite direction. It says that it says that if you have a sequence of tempered distributions. Wn with on n points which satisfy these properties W1, W5, then you can construct a Hilbert space H and you can construct the field operators O, which satisfy the, the Gordon Whiteman axioms and for, for which Wn are Whiteman functions. 
And this might sound very mysterious because you know how you're going to construct the Hilbert space. It looks like it's a very different, very difficult thing to do, if, unless you already have it. But uh, but in fact, you do have something which looks like a Hilbert space because you have I recall that one of the uh, W axioms was this positivity axioms, which says that this inner product F G is positive definite. Uh, so, so it's not quite a Hilbert space because we have this vector space of functions H zero, which is not a Hilbert space is supposed to be complete and everything, but this is just a vector space of functions which is not complete. But actually, uh, there is some mathematics trick which tells you that you take this vector space, you complete it, and this gives you a Hilbert space. And then on this Hilbert space, everything lives. So that, that, that's how this theorem is proven. It's actually not a very difficult theorem to prove. It's, it's rather easy theorem to prove. But it's very powerful because it tells you that if you don't like Hilbert spaces, you don't need to deal with Hilbert spaces. You, perhaps you just like tempered distributions better, and then you can forget about Hilbert space. Just think in terms of correlation functions. And you, you don't lose any information as long as you think of in terms of all correlation functions of all orders. So that's quite impressive. So Sava, I guess also in the GW axioms, you start with the Hilbert space that's just generated by finite sequences of operators acting on the on the vacuum, right? And then you say it's it's also the completion there in those axioms. The full Hilbert space is just the, the, the Banach space completion of, of, of that vector space. Uh, no, I, I don't think you can you can do it there like this because in order even to state that we have operators and we have operator value distributions and something is uh, you have a unitary representation you have to start with some hilbert space oh like I see. Just to, to to okay i think what i said is true yes i agree i think what i said is true because that's the definition of dense but it is indeed not a constructive thing sort of post facto you can say yes the full hilbert space is the completion of that of the vector space of finite sequences of operators acting on the vacuum. Yeah, but if you don't, for example, have a Hilbert space, you cannot even say that something acts you. I mean, you cannot even formulate yeah. previous axioms, which I agree. That, I agree. Uh, yes. The vacuum is a unique vector. There's a bunch of stuff that you have to do. I see that. I see it. Uh, so I, I think logically. Um, okay, yeah, thanks. You cannot fully get rid of Hilbert space in the previous. Any other questions about this uh, Whiteman reconstruction theorem? So I'm not going to prove this theorem, of course, but what, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to, uh, so we have seen that this uh, Whiteman axioms, they need a lot about temper distributions, a bit more than like what every physicist has some idea about distributions, delta function and so on, but really, we will need more than that uh, for our lecture. So I have to give you some lightning review of, uh, of the theory of distributions. So, so there are actually many theories of distributions uh, that you, you can consider, but uh, all of them, uh, they start by specifying what is your space of test functions. So you have to specify some vector space of test functions. But as I will explain, I mean, as you already seen, and I will motivate it in a second, is that in QFT, we really need uh, the natural space of test functions are this Schwartz test functions. So this is really what you need. But, uh, we will see why in a second. And uh, so these Schwartz test functions, from now on, all test functions are going to be Schwarz test functions. But what does it mean? So it means that you have a function which is a, a C infinity function. So I'm considering it equal one case for simplicity. Uh, and you assume that if you take any derivative of this function and you multiply it by any power of x, then what you get is still bounded as a function of x. 
So basically, these are functions which decay faster than power, any power with all the derivatives at infinity. Or equivalently, you can say, uh, so let's take a maximum of this quantity over all m and n up to some big n, and we call it a norm f n. And so for Schwartz function, this norm is finite for any n. And so as you see, uh, the difference between Schwartz space and some other spaces that you might be familiar with is that usually you just like have a single norm, but here on the Schwartz space, there is no single norm, but there's the sequence of norms and you have to demand that all of them are, uh, are finite. And you cannot just cook up a single norm out of this infinitely many norms because they have to be all finite, but they can grow arbitrarily rapidly with, with n. And so you cannot just take any single one of them. And so that's step one. So you specify your, uh, your test function space. And then a step two is a distribution. So you a space of distributions as prime. And these are called uh, tempered distributions. So the distributions on S are called tempered distributions. And tempered referred to the fact that they cannot grow too rapidly at infinity. So uh, what is a distribution? A distribution is a linear functional. So it's a... Uh, uh, it's a map from a space of test functions f to some real numbers or complex numbers, uh, phi of f. And you know, in, uh, in the conformal bootstrap, of course, we are all very familiar with linear functionals. So in the theory of distributions, we are being a little bit more specific. We are demanding that this linear functional has to be a continuous functional, which means that uh, there has, it has to satisfy the following bound. So the value of phi of f has to be bounded by some norm. So there, is, there exists a certain norm for every distribution phi, there exists a number n such that it is bounded, the functional phi of f is bounded by some constant times this norm of f for all Schwartz functions. So you see there are infinitely many norms, but for each distribution, there exists some finite norm which does the job. And so this number n, which appears in this equation, it characterizes the regularity of distribution. So as we have seen, this norm fn, it involves derivatives up to the order n. And so this equation means that actually, even though this distribution was defined on a space of Schwartz test functions, it doesn't actually need all derivatives. So Schwartz test functions are infinitely differentiable, but this any distribution, any given distribution doesn't actually need all infinitely many derivatives, but it only needs derivatives up to some finite order n. And also function, you know, it, it grows at infinity, not faster than x to the n, roughly in some average sense. So that's, uh, th th this is an important property of temperate distributions. And so, uh, so given this definition, Shana, yeah. I mean, you're saying, I'm confused about your use of the word continuous, but I also vaguely remember that there's some link between bounded and continuous in normed vector spaces up for operators on normed vector spaces. Is that true? Is that why you're saying that the boundedness of this operator? I, I see a statement. Well, if we, had, if, we had the, if we had the Banach space, then this would be basically a very simple property. So uh, now we don't, we don't have a Banach space. We have this space which, uh, which uh, has uh, infinitely many norms uh, yes. and so so there are different indeed also in this case there are different notions of continuity which are equivalent to each other so um, for the purpose of these lectures I'm going to use this notion which is equivalent to any other notion that people have considered so it's kind of 
uh, a nice property. But, but I mean, the statement that like you take a sequence of uh, f and and right that that's that's my standard notion. Yeah, so there is another continuity. notion of continuity which says, for example, that if f converges to zero, then phi of f converges to zero. Yeah. I did not tell you what it means for f to converge to zero, but with an appropriate definition, this property is equivalent to that one. Okay, but that's not trivial, right? It's not for the trillion. Okay, thank you. Slava, just one concrete question to see if I have I understand the intuition. So more regular means bigger than or smaller than in this equation? More regular means smaller n. If you can bound it, so so if it's a if it's a function, if phi is actually a function. For example, if phi is a, if, if phi is a bounded function, then uh, is a bounded integrable function, then we will we could use n equals zero. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Actually, that's what I, I wanted to say that uh, uh, that if we take any bounded continuous function, then uh, it uh, it defines a distribution by by this formula. Uh, where now the integral is the ordinary integral. So we can just integrate this phi of x against f of x, and this is a well-defined distribution. But so, but now we can greatly expand the space of distributions by applying to any distribution various operations. So for example, we can take any distribution and can multiply it by a polynomial, and we do it by just moving the polynomial to the test function, which gives us another test function because of the properties of the short space. And we also differentiate uh, any distribution in, in X by integrating by parts. So this is just a definition by uh, moving the derivatives to the test function and multiplying by minus one to the n. So this gives us a definition. So every uh, distribution this way can be differentiated arbitrary many times and you obtain again a distribution. So that's that's handy. And actually there exists this, uh, this theorem which is called Schwartz representation theorem which tells you that actually any temporal distribution can be written, can be obtained like that with finitely many operations. So, so any temporal distribution can be written as a finite sum of derivatives of bounded continuous functions of some finite order. So th those derivatives do not necessarily exist in the sense of functions, but they exist in the sense of distributions as I explained. And if you multiply them by, again, some polynomials of some finite degree, uh, then you can, then this is just all distributions that you can, uh, that you can possibly have. So, not going to prove this theorem. Okay, then uh, the next very important property for physics is that uh, for any temporal distribution, we can define a Fourier transform. And again, we take this formula, uh, phi hat f equals phi f hat. So if phi is an ordinary function, then you can uh, you can prove this formula. If phi is an ordinary rapidly decreasing function, then and, and f is of, of course a test function, then this formula is just an identity which you prove by interchanging the order of integration. But now we are saying that uh, look, if phi is not a function but is a distribution, this formula still makes sense because in the right hand side when I move f f hat when I move the, the Fourier transform to the, to the test function, there exists this very important property that the Fourier transform of a Schwartz test function is again Schwartz class. So if your function is infinite differentiable and decays at infinity faster than any polynomial, then its Fourier transform has exactly this property. So in fact, the Fourier transform is a, is an isomorphism of Schwartz space on itself, as you can show. And so this implies that 
if phi is a temporal distribution, then phi hat is also a temporal distribution. So the, 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 uh, the class of temporal distributions has a notion of uh, Fourier transform. And that's a very important property, which makes it like uniquely useful for physics. So it's not true for other classes of distributions that you might have considered, uh, have heard about, but for this uh, temporal distribution, this is true. But this regularity parameter n, is it preserved by this Fourier transform? Uh, it's not, uh, I, I don't think it's preserved, but there is a bound like uh, that if phi has regularity n, then phi hat has some regularity, maybe 2n. Or, yeah, there is some liquidity that you can derive, at most 2n. Okay, thank okay. you. And okay, the last thing that uh, that we will need is the notion of support of distribution. Again, I already mentioned this. So, so support of distribution is the largest closed set B, such that if you take any function, any test function F supported in the complement of B, then the distribution phi vanishes on this test function. So that's a, a very a very natural. Uh, definition. So, for example, if you have, we said that the Fourier transform of um, of a white cone function has a Fourier transform supported in the forward light cone. Well, it means that if you take a test function here, f, which is outside of the forward light cone, we contract it with such a test function, you get zero. Okay. And so, okay, given all these properties, we can now explain why is it that we need uh, distributions. Well, the first thing I already said is that white functions are going to be singular on light cones, but not only on light cones. And, uh, and we can also see why we need tempered distributions, because first of all, we need Fourier transform, because we need, uh, we want to for, to be able to formulate the spectral condition, so that is only possible if we can, if we are allowed to make sense of the Fourier transform of our distributions, and this kind of points us towards tempered distributions and not anything else. And we also need uh, to be able to talk about the support both in position space. And in momentum space. So we need support in the position space because we had this micro causality constraint, which says that yeah, we, we, we take two test functions and they have to be their supports are space like separated. Well, this only exists if if your space of test functions contains compactly supported test functions, but also in momentum space. We also need support because we want to have the spectral condition. Again, we need to test functions which are compactly supported in momentum space. And again, if you want uh, test functions compactly supported here and there, the Schwartz space has this property. So it contains compactly supported functions here and there, while other uh, other test uh, test functions would not have this property. For example, if you if you take compactly supported test functions, then the Fourier transform is going to be analytic, so it's not going to vanish on in momentum space on a, on an open set. So that would not be sufficient. So so that basically explains why why we have uh, temporary distributions. Actually, Jo, uh, there were many questions. There's still like, uh, uh, need, I would need still like maybe 10 minutes to finish today's lecture. Do you think it would be sure. okay? First level. Yeah. Just to finish this review of distributions, then I wanted to explain something that is going to be kind of a, a common theme of, of these lectures is that temporal distributions, they appear uh, very naturally as boundary values of analytic functions. So can I ask about what you just set this arrow towards tempered distributions? Yeah. Is this rigorous? Like is that, so suppose I knew nothing about quantum field theory whatsoever besides the axioms you just gave me. 
or uh, do I need tempered distributions? Do I do I am I am I automatically led to tempered distribution? You're basically automatically led to tempered distributions. Yeah. The, the, I mean, it's a bit of a technical discussion. There were some attempts to 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 enlarge even further the space of distributions allowed in um, in quantum field theory. There are there are such things known as Jaffe fields, mm -hmm. but uh, but you would be able to constrain it. I see. So uh, yeah. I'm not sure if it's a theorem, but nobody, there is nothing in the literature which would be, suggest that something uh, more restrictive than this is possible. Okay, thanks. Okay, so so I'm, I, I wanted to treat one particular example, which will kind of demonstrate uh, much of what we discussed today, is that I wanted to, um, to explain how to make sense of this uh, x plus i epsilon to the power gamma, which is a, something that in theoretical physics uh, seems like a very natural thing to natural function to consider. Uh, I want to show that this x plus i epsilon to the power gamma for arbitrary gamma, real, arbitrary real gamma and actually complex gamma as well, is a is a tempered distribution. So what does it really mean? What does it entail? Why is this a non-trivial statement and so on? I think it's a nice example and it connects to a lot of what we are going to be dealing with in the following lectures. And okay, so how do we do it? Well, actually, if gamma is not too small, if gamma is larger than minus one, then this x plus i epsilon to the power gamma, it's a, it's a locally integrable function. So it doesn't have singularities stronger than one over X. So it's clearly a tempered distribution because you can just consider a, a normal integral against the test function. It will converge and it defines a distribution. So there's no problem whatsoever. So the non-trivial case is to make sense of this thing as a tempered distribution for gamma smaller than minus one. And so what, what do we have to do? Well. As I said, it's, it's defined as x plus i epsilon. So it means that we take x plus i, I y for finite y, finite positive y. We integrate it against a test function f of x for minus infinity to infinity. And well, for every y, it is a finite quantity. And now we take a limit. We keep f fixed. We take a limit when y goes to 0. Take the limit. And we need to show two things. So first of all, we need to show that this limit exists for any Schwartz test function f. And we also need to show that uh, it is bounded by some Schwartz norm fn for some n. So we have to show that this n exists. Okay, n will depend on gamma. And so it will show that this regularity of the distribution depends on gamma. These are very natural uh, things, and then we'll we will see how it comes about. So uh, before we start, actually, I want to emphasize that uh, we cannot. One could think that we could do something uh, even simpler than that. We could say, why don't I consider this sort of integral where I uh, deform the contour fully? So I, I, I take x to x plus i y in my function and also take f of x to f of x plus i y dx also in the, um, in the argument of the test function. So if I were allowed to do something like that, then the problem becomes completely trivial because since everything is analytic, if f is analytic and x plus i y i got i y to the gamma is analytic, so there's really no singularity, so everything is analytic, and there's the limit to y clearly exists, it just doesn't depend on y. But that's not what we need to do because our test function is not 
assumed to be analytic. Definitely, it's definitely not necessarily analytic. So we are not allowed to restrict, if we restrict our theory to analytic test functions, we don't get a good theory because we cannot do the Fourier transform, we cannot talk about the support. So we really have to do this for a smooth function. And so th that's the non-trivial part of the, of the game. So how can we make sense of this integral where we deform x plus i y, but we do not deform f of x. f of x stays the same. And actually, there is a there, there is a very general theorem that I'm going to explain, which allows you to do this. It's called Vladimirov's theorem, uh, and it's a very general theorem. It says that let's just take any function s of x plus i y, which is analytic. So we, we we assume that this function is analytic in a certain strip. So for for example, for y between zero and one, it is analytic. And we assume that this function is parallel bounded. So what does it mean? It means that we have the following equality that it doesn't grow as y goes to zero. It doesn't grow faster as a certain power of y times a polynomial of x. And so the claim is that under this condition, this limit that I considered when you integrate this function s of x plus i y against the test function exists for any test function f and is bounded by some norm f of n, f, f sub n. And so it defines a temporal distribution. So you see, it's not a totally trivial, I mean, it, if you haven't thought about this, it's, it may sound a little bit surprising because it looks like, well, it looks like your function s actually is allowed to grow. Well, it, it is allowed to grow as y goes to zero. But nevertheless, when you take this integral against a smooth function, then all this growth somehow averages out, it cancels out. And so that on average, you even in spite of this growth, you get a finite limit. Might look like a surprising thing, but nevertheless, it's true. And so if, if you were to apply this theorem to x plus i y to the power gamma, then of course this function is parallel bounded. So it implies that x plus i plus i epsilon to the power gamma is a temporal distribution. So let me then just explain why this theorem is true. And you can, I, I have some lecture notes that I'm going to post where you can read a little bit more leisurely about this, this proof. So uh, the, the proof uses, I mean, clearly, I mean, the, the analyticity is the key. So you, when you take this function L of Y, which is the, the, the integral of S of X plus I Y against the test function, and let's, keep this test function fixed for this argument. So the idea is to consider a certain derivative of L of Y of some finite order in Y. So we take this L of Y differentiate in, in Y n times, n is an arbitrary number, finite number. So when you take this derivative, let's see, if you differentiate L of Y, you take the derivative, the derivative falls on S, but S is analytic, so the derivative of s of x plus i y in y is up to some i's the same as the derivative of the same thing in x. It's the Cauchy-Riemann equation. So we, now we only have s der, x derivative with which follow on s. We can differentiate, differentiate, integrate by parts. So those der, move those derivatives to f. And so then we get that the nth derivative of l of arbitrary order n is actually uh, the same as the integral of s of x plus i y against the nth derivative of f. Very good. Now we are going to use the parallel bound. So we know that s is bounded by some power of y. So here, here's the parallel bound uh, one over y to the m in the denominator. And so, and when you use the parallel bound, there's also some polynomial P of, P of X, 
But then this polynomial times the derivative of f, f is a Schwartz function. So polynomial times a derivative is bounded, is bounded in fact by one over x squared. So it's integrable. So in fact, there is, exists a certain norm of f such that uh, this inequality is true. So it's so this uh, the nth derivative of L with respect to y is bounded for any y in the strip by some norm of f divided by y to the m. And the important point is that this m does not depend on, on the, the, the order of differentiation. It's the same m. So that's the surprising thing. So you, you, you have the function L of y, you differentiate it, you differentiate it, you differentiate it, and, and somehow the singularity in y stays the same. This is very surprising. Normally, if your function is like, is like growing one over y, then every time you differentiate it, the singularity would increase, but that doesn't happen here. And if this doesn't happen, then this should tell you, well, actually what's, the reason why it doesn't happen is this function L doesn't grow in y at all. It's bounded. And so to show this formally, you just take this inequality that the nth derivative of L is bounded by one over y to the m, and then you integrate it in y. And every time you integrate it in y, you lower the singularity in y. And so if you, if you integrate it sufficiently many times, you get a function which is not singular at all. And so this implies that this limit exists, the limit that the theorem is talking about. And uh, actually, this, this uh, norm which appears here uh, is the norm which shows that uh, the functional is continuous, so it's a temporal distribution. So that's basically the main idea of the proof. You can, uh, you can uh, think about it, and you can read the proof in the notes. Uh, yeah, but OK, well, this just to conclude this uh, Vladimir's theorem, and we'll use this uh, theorem um, many times in his, log in his notes, it shows that uh, there is a natural way to obtain lots and lots of temporal distributions, namely every time you have an analytic function. And if you, can, if you manage to show that your analytic function doesn't grow as you approach the boundary of your space faster than a polynomial, then you are guaranteed that the limit is going to be a temporal distribution. And so that, that's how we are going to show in the end of those lectures that the CFT four point functions are temporal distributions and satisfy Whiteman axioms. Okay, so that was all I wanted to, to say today. So it's, um, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Slava. More questions? Chungi? Uh, yes, uh, maybe you, you'll come to this point. Maybe it's related to Jao's questions. Uh, so far, your discussion, if we were to assume there's a mass gap, so this is just this is similar parallel to what we in the old days discussed the relation between axiomatic Whiteman approach to analytic S metrics there. Is there what aspect of your discussion here really brings into the new feature that for CFT we'll be talking about theory without a mass gap? No, what is going to play a role in the end at this stage, it was uh, no, not at all a good moment uh, to emphasize this, but what I'm going to explain next time. So ne next time I'm going to show that it's quite easy uh, to start with Whiteman functions and obtain uh, Schwinger functions, which are which satisfy various nice properties, and that's true again whether you have mass gap or you don't have mass gap. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the problem appears when you want to go back from Schwinger functions to Whiteman functions. 
-hmm. So in uh, so the, there there is going to be this uh, linear growth condition that uh, has been proposed by by this uh, Osterwald and Schrader, which they used to show that you can actually go back from uh, from Schwinger functions to Weipel functions. Well, and that was again in the theory with or without mass gap, but it was only for theories with Poincare symmetry. So their theory was uh, for theories with Poincare symmetry. Would you remind now, me? Now, in the conformal what? field theory, you can do more, but what is going to uh, to help you is not the mass gap or its absence. What is going to help you, what is going to help us is the conformal symmetry. Okay. Could you remind me what you mean by Schwinger function? Uh, I'm just Schwinger sure. function, I mean Euclidean, Euclidean uh, correlation functions. Oh, I see. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So your theorem invites the natural question, how many of these distributions we can obtain as um, limits of analytic functions, in other words, whether there's some surjectivity. Can every distribution in some sense be obtained as a limit of, of, of an analytic function? Every temperate um, No, I don't think so. I, I don't. Um... It sounds a bit too good to be true, but that was for me. No, was I, I don't. I don't think so. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe some. No, definitely, it's not true because for, for, I think if you allow, um, uh, for example, there are some distributions which can be only obtained as differences of two distributions one of which is the limit of analytic function from one direction and another is from the other direction. So if you just require that you are you, you, you get an analytic function moving from one direction, then I think only a, a small subset of distributions is going to be obtained this way. Yeah, like a delta function is probably one of uh, the distributions that falls in the class that you just described. That you cannot obtain this way, delta function. Yeah, but there's a limit from both sides. As a limit for both sides, you can. Yeah, there is a famous formula. Like, uh, yeah. So what is this? But then, okay. That 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 the delta of x. Yes. Is uh, a real part of one over x, x, x plus i epsilon. Mm. Plus one over x minus i epsilon. That's some coefficient, right? Um, minus, no? I mean minus. One minus the other. Yeah. Yeah, one minus the other. If I may ask, just to, for further clarification, in the theory with a mass gap, of course, the relation between Schwinger's function and Feynman function, in some sense, you can interpret one as the discontinuity of the analytic continuation of uh, appropriate analytic continuation of Schwinger function. So would you be basically this also holds in the case of uh, CFT? Is that the current going to be yeah, the plan? Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. So in in any theory, Weibel functions and Schwinger functions mm -hmm. are, are related by analytic continuation, whether you you do have or you don't have a mass gap. That's something that I'll, I'll explain next time. But when you uh, the problem is that this analytic continuation is very easy from Weitman to Schwinger. But it's uh, much harder from Schwinger to Whiteman because uh, yeah. So that's I, I was planning to explain next time. So when you go from Whiteman to Schwinger, you just stick in uh, some decrease in exponential in your Fourier transform, and it does always make sense. But uh, to go from Schwinger to that to Whiteman, it's uh, even to construct the analytic continuation is a, is a non-trivial problem. And to show that you get uh, a temporary distribution back in the limit, it's even more non-trivial problem because then you have to satisfy this uh, power law bound and it's not easy to show that it's satisfied. Uh, but in a conformal field theory, we will see that uh, there is a natural way 
to perform a synthetic continuation to show that the Farrell bound holds. So, so this way we will recover Whiteman functions from Euclidean four point functions in continuity theory. But the relation is true in any theory. It's just the question is how do you actually perform this in the creation? It's just like one, one thing is to say, oh, yeah, it should exist, but another thing is to concretely perform it. It's not obvious how to do it. I think there's a question from uh, Zhe Chuang. Uh, yes. Uh... I have a question that uh, uh, you just proved that uh, x plus i y to the gamma in the limit of y it is a temporary distribution, right? Yeah. So uh, what is is the representation of uh, from the Schwarz representation theorem that it is a sum over some finite sum over partial differentiation? I didn't see it uh, very straightforward. Uh, yeah, I, I, I did, no, I did not write it because you see for, in fact, this distribution X plus I epsilon to the gamma. Yes. There are, uh, there are many ways to define this distribution. So uh, I defined it through this Vladimirov's theorem, which has an advantage because it's going to apply to any function with a parallel bound. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you have this very simple explicit formula, then you can, there are various other tricks that you can, <clears throat> that you can use to define your distribution. So for example, let me, um, let me just show you one, one, one trick and then it will become clear that you can use such, such tricks in, in many different ways. For example, let me define another distribution that I will call uh, X plus, to the gamma. So this is going to be distribution, which is equal to X to the gamma for X positive at equal to zero for X negative. And then, okay, the, the only question is what happens if X is exactly equal to zero. Mm -hmm. so, so this distribution, you can try to define it by differentiation in X. Because you know we, we know that if, if you take x gamma prime, then of course it's equal to gamma x gamma minus one. And so this is true if gamma is larger than uh, if gamma is larger than than uh, uh, if, if gamma is positive, then this is true, right? Because both sides of this uh, are ordinary functions. Uh, and now we, we can try to use this equation to extend the, the definition of the distribution to negative, uh, to more and more negative gamma. And then you could try to, uh, you could try then to define, for example, X plus I epsilon to the gamma, you could try to define as, once you define this distribution X plus, uh, let me call this distribution Psi gamma of X, you could try to write something like that. Uh, uh, psi gamma of X plus E to the I pi gamma, Psi gamma of minus X. And this would give you another definition of the distribution X plus I epsilon gamma, which will agree with the other distribution, with the, with the other distribution, with the other definition that we gave. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think by using this differentiation trick, you will be able to find uh, a Schwartz representation for this distribution X plus I epsilon to the gamma. Just try to integrate it and see what happens. I mean, if you, if you want to, you, know, you can try to approach this explicitly, differentiate this, integrate this distribution several times in X and see what comes out. After a certain number of integrations, you will, uh, will, you will get, obtain uh, an ordinary function. You will just have to be a bit careful because for some values of gamma, it will look like you have some poles and you will just have to show that those poles actually vanish. So I, I think you can do something like that. Okay, I'll try, thanks. Is a Gaussian in your class of test functions? e to the minus x squared yeah of course it is a, it yes. is a schwartz cost 
So you can try those as examples, right? You can try those uh, as examples, meaning? For these bounds, yeah. Yeah, so what I, when I, uh, when I said pick any F, yeah, you can, particularly you can pick this one. Any other questions? Okay, so if not, let's thanks Slav again. Next time it's going to be more, more to physics. Today I had to go to the distributions, but again, next time it will be really Oh, this is more about physics correlation functions and so on, armed with this new knowledge. Oh, this is very useful. Okay, so uh, I will I will stop uh, the recording now and uh, I will close the room and see you see you soon for the for the talk uh, by Walter Landry at uh, five. <laughs>